Windsor. I'm here today with my colleague Linda Soldo and Kelly Gordon. I am the Director of Programming and Public Relations at the East Meadow Public Library. Here, us. Um, this is maybe the 10th year of collaboration between Long Island Traditions and the East Meadow Public Library. It might be longer. It might be. Um, and why? Why? Because they do such an amazing job bringing people together through different cultures and, and um, teaching us about how we all share a space and how we all can learn from each other. Um, I, I think Long Island Traditions is a boom to communication, um, which is my first, I just think that's the most important thing. So we welcome them here today. This is funded through a grant by the New York State Council of the Arts. Also a boom. Um, I'll introduce you. Okay. I'm gonna introduce you to the director and the founder of Long Island Traditions, Nancy Solomon. I almost called you Solomon. Well, once again, it's a real pleasure to be here at the East Meadow Public Library, and I thank you very much, Jude, for partnering with us, you on so many interesting programs. Now, some of you who, have, who come here regularly may have noticed that the last couple of years we've been focusing on women of tradition. And we're doing this because first, you know, we feel that, you know, many times women's voices are not heard. And especially when it comes to cultural traditions, it's, you know, sometimes assumed incorrectly that it's the men who, who pass these on. And fortunately, there are some amazing women that take their responsibility as tradition teachers very seriously. So we have three women from different generations. I'm going to, sitting on my right is Denise Silva Dennis, who is a member of the Shinnecock Reservation here on Long Island. On my near left is Ina McNeil, who is from the Lakota, um, South Dakota tribe, who calls has called Long Island home for 40 years for almost over 40 years. And to my far left is Taylor Smith, who is Ina McNeil's granddaughter, who is a native Long Islander, and has learned many of the traditions of both these cultures, both the Shinnecock and the Lakota. And she'll tell you a little bit about why she is so familiar with them. So we're gonna start first, you know, by learning, you know, more about the, the cultures and the different artistic traditions that are practiced by each of these women through you know, some general questions and we're gonna invite you to also ask your questions. I don't wanna be the only talking head up here. So um, Denise, um, I first met you when we had gotten a grant um, to do some after school programs at the Shinnecock Reservation. That was back in, I don't know, 1994 or five, it was a long time ago. And you were a brand new art teacher at the time. So why don't you first tell people a little bit about your family history on the reservation and then also about your own career as an artist. All right, well, thank you for inviting me once again and also to the East Meadow um, Library. It's a pleasure, and I'm so glad to see everyone who came out today. Um, my English name is Denise Silva Dennis, but my Native American name is Wiedema, and I come from the Silva Arrow clan. And actually, my father um, comes from a tribe up in Massachusetts. It's called the Nipmuc Hassanamisco. Uh, reservation. It's very tiny. It's the third tiniest um, tribe there is in the United States. And then my mom, on my mom's side, Princess Silva Arrow, she comes from the Shinnecock Reservation. And I was lucky enough to marry another Shinnecock uh, man, and his dad also comes from Shinnecock as well as, as his mother. And his father served as a tribal trustee for many years on the um, reservation governance and so did my father. So I talk about coming from two chiefs, two lines of chiefs. And then with my mother-in-law and my mom, 
it's to you know women who taught me quite a bit about the traditions of the tribe along with the families there. I started um, learning about Native American beadwork actually from my mother and it, my parents, because I'm the youngest in the family, the older brothers and sisters were always um, in powwows and they're what we call regalia. We don't call it costumes, we call it Native American regalia, what I have on today. So my oldest sister and my father actually taught me through the years how to prepare the regalia made out of deer skin. And then I begged my mother one summer, I said, Mom, could you teach me how to make the beadwork? So she pulled out the family trunk that had everybody's regalia in it and we made a new regalia for me, actually from one of my brother's outfits, and that's how I got started doing beadwork. And then through the years, we had a um, program on the reservation in the 70s called the um, SNAC, and that uh, was short for Shinnecock Native American Cultural Coalition. And I was about maybe 13 or 14 when that started, and that was taking pride as all over the United States with uh, Native American issues, and um, there was uh, one of my cousins, was married to one of my cousins, um, Princess Thunderbird, and that was Chief Thunderbird's wife, and she came in and taught us how to do beadwork. So I was in awe the first time I walked into one of her classes. She had her loom work up, and I was just, it just took my breath away. So that began a whole nother level of doing beadwork, and what you see to the right of me, or to your left, are samples of my uh, beadwork, and what I try to do is stay in the vein of the woodland uh, floral design, or you'll see turtles there. Um, some of the work I do are um, animals, like I, I do, I paint jackets as my contemporary work, so I do fox and wolves and eagles and all kinds of things, and um, I also have some photos of my family here and at various uh, powwows. Our big one is the Shinnecock Powwow, which is Labor Day weekend. That's the um, end of August, the last day of August, and the first, second, third of September for Labor Day. So you're all welcome to come on out to Shinnecock, and you would really in, enjoy that. Um, as I grew older, I went to school, um, Hamilton College in upstate New York, and I got my undergraduate degree in studio art. And then I continued from there to get my um, master's degree in uh, um, special education. I became a special education in the Southampton School District and I just retired from there about two years ago. So now I'm pursuing my love of art and sh happy to share it with people who are interested and I thank you for coming out today and for your interest. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Denise, um, a lot of people you know, have probably not been to the reservation. Can you tell us more about what it was like you know, growing up and living there? What are some of the, the the traditions and the various recognitions of different stages of life that you were a part of? Well, growing up on the reservation, I was outdoors all the time. Um, my parents um, had, well, like I said, I was the youngest, so we had moved. We were actually in a neighboring town, and we moved to the reservation when I was the baby in the family, so that's really all I knew was the reservation. So. Every time you turn around, my father would bring home some kind of new animal for us. So it was like growing up with, um, I had a fawn as a pet. I had uh, baby raccoons, baby rabbits, tons and tons of dogs. It's like, there's <laughs> so many dogs, horses. Um, chickens for a while until one pecked me on my head and then we got rid of those chickens. <laughs> and it was just um, being really an outdoors person, um, just walking. It was you, f you were free to walk wherever you wanted to go on the reservation. It actually, it's a peninsula out in Southampton and then you look across the water and then you see the multi-million dollar estates right across the way. So it's a polarization of worlds at the same time. But it really is, it's a beautiful, beautiful place to um, actually take in the beauty of Shinnecock Bay and Hetty Creek. Of course, we have you know, different um, issues on the reservation as well as different <coughs> struggles, but it's, a, it's kind of a balancing act between the two worlds. Um, at one time, we had a, on the reservation, we had a um, school there until the 1950s. So most of the children went to school until they were in eighth grade and then they went on to high school 
in the village of Southampton. But when I came up, I went through kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade at Southampton and graduated from Southampton High School. Can you tell us whether, you know, what were some of the things that you remember hearing other, you know, people in the school district telling others about the history of, of the Shinnecock and um, some of the things that you had to do in response to that? Well, growing up um, as a child, I can only remember maybe one teacher in third or fourth grade actually taking an interest in the history of any type of Native Americans. And I can remember doing a, a report with one of my non-Native friends there. So it really was not um, growing up through the 60s and into the 70s. It was really um, not shared at all in the Southampton School District. Now, I worked there for 21 years, and on my retirement last year was the first time that the South, you may have even seen it, read it in the newspapers or I Googled it, it was the first time that the Southampton School District actually introduced the Shinnecock history and curriculum into the classrooms. So it took all those years. It's just mind boggling that it, it has taken this long. So what were some of your impressions, you know, of your classmates, you know, in, in school? You know, did it, were any of them, did you introduce any of them to your culture and to your history? Um, you there. Yeah, I was friends growing up, I guess up into maybe fourth or fifth grade. I was, um, friend, had a lot of friends in the outside community. So I would visit them in the village of Southampton and then they would come up to visit me and they most of them were like from um, middle class um, situations and then I did have um, native friends on Shinnecock as well and also the African American community um, but as I got older um, like on the reservation you can't get a mortgage so one of the things that families struggle with is trying to build a house while raising their family so it became kind of you know like they would start asking questions like, well, how come your house isn't finished? And how come, you know, you don't have siding on the you know, sides of your house? Or how, you know, what did, what's going on here? But what they didn't realize is that we're not like them. We don't have mortgages. We just do the best we can and build as we go. And my father happened to be a carpenter. So the way he got the materials, um, at least to begin our house, was he took apart a parsonage um, over in the town of Riverhead. They were um, you know, deconstructing it and to build a new one. And he carefully uh, secured the windows and the doors and then transport, transported everything over to Shinnecock. And that's how he was able to build a home for us the best that he could with you know, six children and a wife. Mm -hmm. It wasn't easy. So what was your first powwow that you really remember like? <laughs> well, probably my parents took me when I was very young. Really, the first thing I remember culturally is riding on my horse at one of the parades. Um, and I think it probably was in Hempstead or somewhere in this area. And uh, Governor Rockefeller was actually in the stands, and he picked me out. I had my little white Native American dress on, and I had my little rattle in the middle of all the you know, older kids. And he picked me out and he set me on his lap for a few <laughs> minutes. Yeah, I have a picture. There's a picture in the Newsday. That was in the 60s. But other than that, um, as I, the times that I can remember dancing in the powwow uh, was a, a little dance that I used to do by myself. It was called the bird dance. And everybody who remembers that bird dance, they still call me Weedemo because they knew every year I would go out all by my little old self and do this little dance. And the other thing, um, when we were building our house on the reservation, when my dad dug the hole for the foundation, instead of um, redistributing the soil, he made like a little mound and then he built a stage. So back in the 70s, we actually had our own little Native American village um, in the summers and we'd get a lot of people. People used to just come, on, come up on the reservation to visit and just drive along. They were like, where are the Indians? Where are the Indians? I guess they were looking for teepees, but we never lived in teepees. <laughs> we lived in what's called wigwams or wiki-ups, so they didn't even know to look for that. But we used to have um, all kinds of little dances, like the berry dance, and dances at our Shinnecock Powell. You don't really see 
those kind of dances anymore the hunters dance but there was i again doing my little bird dance so who were some of the most important people men and women that really imparted to you the knowledge that helped influence your artistic career i would say my parents first and foremost um, even though they weren't artists, my dad was really good at um, doing drawings of houses. And he was very skilled with that, with the plans of a house, houses like architectural uh, plans. And just my mother's encouragement, you know, to say, oh, do this better. Or, oh, I think you could do, instead of doing a little bit of bead work on that moccasin, I think you can do the whole moccasin. Even though she didn't even do any of the bead work oh, at that point, I was doing all the bead work. But, uh, and then, of course, it was um, Princess Slenderbird, like I said before, Edith Bess, um, and um, of course, uh, Princess Noah Donna, when I was a little girl, she was our historian on the reservation, and also my um, brother-in-law uh, and my sister, the oldest kids in the family, because they're the ones who were uh, co-founded that organization I told you about, the SNAC. How many people live on the reservation then, you know, when you were growing up and now? Well, there were probably about around maybe 200, 250 when I was growing up. And then uh, now there's a little over 300, maybe 350. But worldwide, there's like a little under 2,000. And uh, Taylor even has an aunt who lives in Australia. So I think she's maybe the one who lives the furthest away. <laughs> So I'd like you to you know, maybe you know pick up you know some of the different things that you've brought here today, and describe you know how you made them you know the materials that are used, and what they are used for. All right. Well, start right next to me. I have a um, a necklace here, and it actually started out on top as a little. Um, belt for my daughter when she that was her first belt powwow a little beaded belt and again it has the the floral design because that's the design of the woodland people and then it has some eagle feathers in it it was done on loom part of it and it even has a little bit of wampum in it and wampum i don't know if you know about that it comes from the quahog shell and so i try to incorporate the purple wampum um, as a salute to our ancestors who Really, it was like the seat of the wampum makers. And they actually, um, up in the nations up north, uh, the Haudenosaunee, or known as Iroquois, they would come down to Shinnecock of the Wampanoag and Narragansett to get those shells and for their treaty belts. So I try to incorporate the wampum, as I said. Um, and then this pouch, actually I made it for my mother-in-law and it's made with um, leather on the sides and also it has the turtle because the turtle is part of our creation story where we believe that the first woman came from the clouds and the creator sent her down uh, from the sky and she was already pregnant and she landed on the back of a, a, the turtle and she and the turtle became friends and uh, then from then on she had her children and then populated the earth and in one of her pouches, maybe like one like this, she carried the corn. And then she started planting the corn on the back of the turtle. And I also did some work with my daughter and I. She, we wrote, co-wrote this when she was a little girl. Actually, she went to Catholic school. And it's called, I Ask My Mom Why. And one day she asked me, why is it that there's only men who are the tribal trustees or the governing people? of the tribe, so I had to explain to this little girl why, so it's appropriate for women's, <laughs> the women's time and me too power to <laughs> explain to a little girl. And it actually has a little bit of the history of our tribe and drawings that I did with her. Maybe you'll be able to come up and see it later. But uh, what happened with the reservation, the reason why we even have um, three male tribal trustees, that was really a, a colonial imagination. Because when the colonists came over, first they came down from Massachusetts, but originally from England, um, they didn't want to deal with any women, of course. And so they only wanted to deal with men. So in the 1700s, they're the ones who implemented this trustee system. 
which I don't really think have worked that great <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> <laughs> through all these hundreds of years. Um, and in our history, we had a woman named Kwashalam, and she was the, called the Sunk Squaw of the tribe. And she, after her husband passed away, she took over leadership from the tribe. Progress is always slow, but it is coming. It is. Oh. <laughs> it is. Um, I know that there have been, you know, changes in some of the materials that Native Americans have worked with for some of these, you know, um, ritual objects, and some of that may have to do with, you know, you know, as the environment changes, some of those materials are no longer available. I was wondering if you could talk about how some of the things, you know, that you've used, you know, have changed and, and why you've changed. You know. Oh well, I know. Uh, originally, <coughs> back in time, a lot of shells were used or seeds were used, and I did used to use a lot of seeds and shells for some of my beadwork. Even though the seed beads, you know, in my time have always been available, and for a time there weren't. Uh, that much wampum to be used as there once was. And nowadays, there are people actually who have wampum factories like over in Mastic. Uh, the Uncachog at the Puspatuck Reservation actually have a lot of uh, wampum available. So that kind of came full circle um, as part of a product to use. And for me, I, I pretty much stay or try to stay with um, using deer skin leather, um, goose feathers. I try to make it as, um, come from our area as much as possible, indigenous to our area. But then once in a while, I see a beautiful feather that might come from South America, so I just have to incorporate that mm -hmm. into my beadwork, mm -hmm. or a feather fan. Um, I know that you've also you know, done quite a bit in visual arts. Um, when we first met, we did a mural project together. And I was wondering if you could talk a, li a little bit about some of those types of projects that you've done. Uh, well, the, with the uh, mural pro project that we had done, I did the history um, of the tribe starting out with a woman with her baby that came from the sky and she's planting the corn um, near our ancestral lands because actually Shinnecock is ancestral. We were never really moved from great distances. We we're the original people to the land. And then it goes on to tell also the history of whaling and um, how important that was. And it was actually international uh, whaling. Where people went all over the world, and some people even uh, made it to Samoa and Australia and Alaska. And some people decided just to stay there. So there could even be many more Shinnecock people all around. And then it, um, the mural I'd done for Shinnecock also depicts like the Shinnecock Church and how that's the oldest mission church in the United States. It's uh, two, over 275 years old. And um, it also shows um, our old school, which is no longer there. It burned uh, to the ground in the 60s. I think it burned twice. And then the last time it burned, um, it, it was not rebuilt. It acted as a community center. And in its place, we have a cement community center. However, uh, now we have a preschool on the reservation. And it's called the Winnichin Up Preschool. And children who are from I think six weeks up to four years attend that, and they're learning the indigenous uh, languages there as well. I also did a um, mural at the when it was called the New York Telephone uh, Company in Southampton, and it was much like the one on Shinnecock. It, it started as a village, Shinnecock village, and then it transitioned to modern day when the English came and started putting up the fences for uh, fields and their homes and. The Shinnecock people couldn't get to their traditional areas to um, hunt any longer or to plant any longer, and then it kind of transitioned into the modern day Southampton. So I've been involved with things like that. Okay, so my last question is, can you talk a little bit about your son Jeremy and the work that he's doing? It's, it's just incredible. No, thank you. Um, yes, my, um, I have two children, and Jeremy is the youngest. And he is a photographer. He went to Stony Brook. He graduated from there um, with a degree in studio art, a majoring in uh, photography. And then he went on to Penn State for his master's degree. So um, he has those two degrees. And it, when Jeremy was growing up, 
he did not want to learn how to read, he wasn't interested in writing, he just wanted to do art. But of course you have to have your basics. And myself as a school teacher, I'm like, come on, you have to do your work, you have to do your, you know, do your social studies report. So with my husband and I, we're always like amazed that now he's writing his own books, you know, and all we do is maybe edit them, <laughs> you know, and, and he has to do presentations. And when he grew up, he's like his dad, he was really, really quiet and didn't really feel comfortable talking in front of groups of people. But now he's uh, currently showing at Stony Brook University where he graduated and uh, some of his artwork is in Legends. It's all about legends. And then he is also um, at Old Westbury currently exhibiting because he's um, he's like a specialist in the IT world where he's able to um, document different places on Long Island, especially the East End and the North and South Fort and where old forts used to be or where old, old prayer grounds used to be, um, where the original churches or meeting halls uh, once were or where the whales were brought into shore, so he documents Long Island, and then he puts all these little icons on, on, and what you do is you just touch the icon, and then it brings a photograph for you to look at to see what it looks like, the area it looks like now, and it may be developed, or it may be almost in its natural um, place again, look like the natural place as it once was, it might be polluted now, it looks beautiful, but it might be a toxic Know, area or with a lawn chair thrown in the water. So he documents all of this and just you know writes about it now. And he was also at Suffolk Community College, but he's been in the Guild Hall, the Parish Art Museum. He's like he's all over the place. So if you really want to know, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, he's under Jeremy Native. If you want to look that up, and that's J E R E M Y Native, and you'll see his other work. So now it's your turn for you to ask questions. We, we're going to you know, keep it to around 10 minutes. So, uh, yes. Um, yeah, I have two questions. I first, I have, please, without how many uh, Native uh, Shinnecock um, language, how many people speak the Shinnecock language about? I mean, the question was how many people speak the Shinnecock okay. language? And that, I know there's also a story behind it. Yeah, there's a story behind it. It's funny. Well, what happened with our language is when the colonists came, it's like you have to speak English. You are no longer able to speak your language. And if you were to speak your language back a couple of hundred years ago, then you would be punished. So the way that the language actually survived is because the language was written into Bibles. So it's there, and um, I have to quote something that one of Taylor's uncle said, Uncle Roddy, who has studied um, the language, and he said it was just, it was, it's there, it's just sleeping right now, but it's being awakened. And the place, it's one of the places it's being awakened is at the Shinnecock Preschool, because the children are learning their numbers, they're learning conversation. So there's, there's a group of people actually who study it, um, at Stony Brook, there's a special um, course up there. So I'm not really sure of the numbers, but I know it's slowly being resurrected. And really, it's here all along because you have Ronkonkoma, you have Montauk Highway. It's all around us. We say it all the time. But we just in Massapequa. Those are all <laughs> parts of Rosinica. It's all part, it's there. You just have to study it like any other language and um, just, you know, use it. And the other question I had was those yes, tiny bees that you use, when, I, I can't see that they were available so, you know, hundreds of years ago. So when did that transition into being used, when did they start using those tiny bees? I once tried it and, and I said, oh my gosh, this is amazing that you can do this work. Okay, so the question is, when did you start using the kinds of beads that you use, you know, for, for your bead work, and when did that come into being, you know, on, you know, as part of the Native American craft trade? I'm not sure really exactly um, of the time, but I know before the beads, um, quill work was used on the porcupine, mm -hmm. and um, also because we're an island and the seashells, mm -hmm. They were all used. So it was at whatever time that the um, Europeans first 
bought them over for trading with the tribe. And I know beads, larger beads were bought over, but so probably sometime, probably very early. Um, the first colonists came in 1640, so probably by 1670, beads <coughs> must have been over here in America by then. Um, Ina, who is also uh, very accomplished in beadwork, has some thoughts on this. The glass Venetian beads were brought to this country by the Dutch. Okay. So they're the ones that brought from Venice, Italy, the glass beads that introduced them to the indigenous people. Yeah. Prior to that, they didn't exist here. Right. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yes, the young man in the... Um, earlier you mentioned that you like, uh, when you make your art using as much natural resources uh, that are local to the small island as possible. And, uh, mm -hmm. Since you first started uh, doing the crafts and art, has there ever been any resources that just aren't, aren't around anymore okay. from the ecosystem? Okay. The, the question is, you know, in using some of the natural materials, you know, to make your artwork, have have you had to turn to other sources as those um, um, materials um, if they've disappeared? If you know. You, you know, in the local environment? Um, I would say um, no, because we still have deer. Our primary resources would have been deer anyway, and there's like 10 deer in my yard right now. <laughs> 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 um, and of course, we'd use all the deer, not only the meat when it's uh, hunting season, but all the, also the antlers and the hooves and um, the bones, you know, for different parts. And then there's, you know, from our area, we have the um, arrowhead, so I mean if somebody needs to go and get some quartz, a quartz stone that can be found. Um, the wampum was big back, you know, in time in memorial, so that's still around. It's all really still here. The only thing that we do not have access to, I would say, is the right whale, and that was the original whale that the Shinnecock people were able to go and um, capture and bring in. And uh, so every once in a while, a whale comes up near the reservation, um, but on the ocean side of the reservation. Not that the reservation is connected to the ocean. There's like a little um, stream, a little area in between the tip of the reservation and the ocean dune. But um, the whales are protected, you know, by the federal government. But we have requested the fin and the tail because that was our original religion, fin, using the fin and the tail of the whale and we were still prohibited. We'd have to go into a court fight and probably lose even though now we're federally recognized um, by the federal government. That would be the main um, issue, I would say. Okay. We have time for one more question. Um, uh, there's a woman in the back. Why can't you get a mortgage? question is why can't you get a mortgage? The reason why you can't get a mortgage on our reservation is because the land is owned by all of the people and members are given a, an allotment and that's approved by the, uh, what we call them, the um, COT, the Council of Trustees. Um, and because a bank can't, if you um, are not a delinquent on your payments, the um, bank can't take the house away because it's on the reservation. <laughs> You can't foreclose on it. <laughs>